About nine months ago, I set out to develop, complete, and release my first indie game. No more abandoning projects, no more giving up. I really wanted to finish something, so I did. Two weeks ago, I released Blink, a casual mobile game where you play as a firefly trying to light up a dark forest. Just from the gameplay here, it looks pretty simple, and in fact, it was a pretty straightforward project. That said, it still took me nine months to get it out the door. So what happened? In this video, I want to walk you through everything that I had to learn in order to take an idea and a blank Unity project and turn it into a fully realized game and release it on the Apple and Google App Stores. I hope that if you're just starting out on your own first project, this will serve to motivate you and give you an idea of what your game development journey might look like. When I really started working on Blink, I didn't even have a blank Unity project yet, just an idea of what I wanted to build. So before writing my first line of code, I set out to organize my thoughts. I used two really helpful tools for this. The first was just some kind of notebook. This served as a place to jot down every idea I had for Blink. At the start, I just dumped all my ideas in here, but as the project progressed, I kept it close by so that I could quickly capture any new ideas or improvements that popped into my head. I really recommend this approach. Whenever I was away from my computer doing other things, I'd often find myself thinking about my game and coming up with some cool ideas to implement later. Quickly jotting these down in a notebook or even just the notes app on my phone helped me capture these ideas efficiently and ultimately convert them into improvements for Blink. Once I had some of these ideas recorded for my game, I tried to take things a step further by converting those into some initial development tasks. I did this using a great free tool called Trello. With Trello, you can set up different lists for tracking development tasks. If you're just starting out, I'd recommend a minimum of three lists, to do, in progress, and complete. This is what my Trello board looked like during Blink's development, and I'll be the first to admit that it's a little bit of a mess. Overall though, it really helped me stay productive and organized, and I bet I'd still be working on the project without it. So I really suggest you give it a try. The next phase of this project for me was development of the game itself, and I would estimate that this took up about 80% of my total time spent on the project. I've gone back through all my old devlogs for Blink and highlighted 10 major milestones during my development that I think are worth mentioning. In many cases, they correspond to a specific game development or Unity skill that I learned that you may also find yourself learning on your first project. The first of these milestones was getting my project set up in source control. Although this step is technically optional, I really consider it to be required. Utilizing source control for my project helped me track and organize code changes as well as provide me with the backup in case something really bad happened to my development machine. I personally use GitHub and SourceTree for this project, but you do have other options out there. I've actually created a tutorial on how to get a Unity project properly set up in GitHub. If you're interested, you can click the link on the screen or in the description to check that out. Next up, I completed some basic placeholder artwork for the project. Now, most experienced developers would probably tell you to skip all the art at the beginning and get straight to prototyping in order to make sure that your idea for your game is actually fun to play. I definitely agree with that advice, but I also don't regret doing just a tiny bit of artwork up front. A big part of this project for me was actually learning to create pixel art, and I really did not bring any existing artistic expertise to the table when I started. Cranking out a basic background and player character at the beginning of development gave me confidence that I'd be able to learn this skill, and it also ended up making my prototype look a lot more like the finished product, which was very motivating as I spent time working on the gameplay. If you're wondering, I created all of Blink's artwork using my iPad Pro and Apple Pencil. I used an app called Pixaki to draw the art and an app called Working Copy to push this artwork from my iPad to my Git repository. This ended up being a really productive workflow for me. After I had some placeholder art created, it was time to start on the core gameplay loop. This actually came together pretty quickly. My intent was for this to be a casual or hyper-casual mobile game, so there wasn't much complexity to begin with. All I really had to do was learn how to capture touching and dragging events from my player object, create and instantiate prefabs for the circles that show up on the screen, and do some basic math to determine how closely the circles generated by the player match the target circles drawn on the screen. Once I had those basics nailed down and improved the visuals a little bit, I built the game to my iPad and asked my friends to play. This was an absolutely crucial step early on. My friends helped me identify bugs as well as tweaks that can make the game more fun and engaging. During this preliminary testing phase, I made changes to the player movement speed, the sizes and fill speed of the circles, and how quickly the game could end. If you're working on a solo project and you have the ability to build a prototype to a test device, I really recommend you do that and let your friends play. Having a more diverse source of feedback early on in your game's life cycle can really make a big difference in how fun your game turns out. At this point, I had a working prototype with relatively fine-tuned gameplay, and I honestly could have released the game at this point. The gameplay wouldn't have been all that different from what's on the App Store today. But I knew from the start of this project that I didn't want to release a demo, but instead a fully recognized version of my initial idea. 
So I set out to add a bunch of new features and polish the overall experience. Perhaps the most important piece of polish that I put on Blink was getting my pixel art graphics to look pixel perfect on all devices. When I started this project, Unity had a preview package available to help achieve this. But rather than using that, I ended up writing my own small script to help me understand how this would work. This is what I came up with. It's basically just a script that calculates exactly what the orthographic camera size should be based on the zoom I want, the pixels per unit at which I import my assets, and the reference resolution of my game. I also have some code in there to make my background fill whatever device the game is running on. This was a bit of a pain to figure out, but I ultimately could not have released the game without it since Blink would have to run on a huge number of different mobile devices. Next, I decided I wanted to implement leaderboards for Blink. The core goal of Blink's gameplay is to achieve new high scores, so adding leaderboards seemed like a no-brainer. I started out just implementing these for iOS, and quickly determined that I wasn't a big fan. The native Game Center UI just stuck out like a sore thumb alongside my custom art and UI, and I convinced myself it wouldn't look any better on Android. Ultimately, for better or worse, I ended up removing leaderboards from Blink. Now, I do think this is good and bad. It helped me release Blink earlier, which is great, but at the same time, I still think leaderboards are a great fit for the game, so I'll probably implement them in a later update. But with leaderboards gone now, I wanted to give the player another reason to keep playing and challenging their high score. From here, I started work on my progression system, which consisted of cosmetic unlocks to reward both global score and high score milestones. I started off working on rewards for increasing your global score. This is content that you'd unlock just for playing the game or regardless of your skill level. I ended up creating 16 playable characters that the player is constantly progressing towards. I gathered feedback from my YouTube videos and development live streams to help order these characters and define the point values at which you'd unlock them. I tweak these values a lot and I'm still not totally convinced I have them right, but at the end of the day it actually is pretty satisfying to unlock these guys in the game, so I'm happy with how it turned out. Next up was creating rewards for high score achievements. Now, this was targeted towards players who were more skilled and able to pass certain score milestones within a single round. Because these achievements would be a little harder to obtain, I wanted to put in a little more effort to create something that would seemingly have a larger impact on the player. So, rather than just creating more characters, I spent quite a lot of time creating four unlockable environments. Each of these completely changes the look of the game and can make the game feel kind of fresh if you've been playing in the same environment over and over for a while. I'm very happy with the way all this content turned out, and I think my progression system has been generally well received by players. That said, none of my unlockable content actually fundamentally changes the way the game is played, which I think is a missed opportunity on my end. For example, maybe it would have been cool to give each unlockable character very slightly different attributes, such as faster flying, circles that grow at different speeds, or maybe even resistance to bats. After finishing up the progression system, I wanted to drastically improve the way the game looked and sounded. One of my favorite changes I made here was adding real lighting to my scene. Initially I was just using a black overlay with adjustable opacity to simulate my scene getting darker over time. I swapped this out for a directional light that would shine onto my background. This combined with a point light attached to my player object created a very cool glowing effect which really made the player look more like a firefly. If you're curious how I did this, I've created a really concise tutorial that walks you through everything in about 5 minutes. You can check that out near the top of the screen or by clicking the link in the description. After lighting came sound, and up until this point there was actually no sound at all in Blink. I was originally thinking I'd record my own soundtrack or like ambient music for the background, but I ended up realizing that, that was not a hurdle I wanted to clear for this project. So I headed off to freesound.org to find some background ambient noise befitting a forest at dusk. And here's what I found. I was pretty happy with how that fit my scene, so I moved on to sounds to accompany my gameplay. As I was trying to figure out what sound to play for a circle fill, I came up with a cool idea for a new gameplay mechanic. It went something like this. For each circle you filled, you would hear a single musical note. If you perfectly filled multiple circles in a row, those notes would progress into a chord. After eight perfect circle fills, you would hear the last chord in the progression and your score multiplier would be increased, earning you more points for each circle fill. This ended up being pretty easy to implement. I used a mini keyboard to record the notes in GarageBand and exported them individually for use in Unity. From there, it was just a matter of deciding when to play each note in the progression. Here's what the whole thing sounds like. The feeling of hitting that final note in the progression is very satisfying, and overall this made for an excellent new gameplay mechanic. Oh, and of course I added a sound for when you get eaten by a bat. With sound taken care of, I had one last visual improvement that I wanted to make to Blake, and that was adding a chance for precipitation. 
This feature was requested repeatedly by a close friend of mine, and I myself absolutely love rainy days, so I figured why not. Using Unity's particle systems, I created a rain effect that has a 20% chance to trigger when you launch the game. As a little extra treat, I created a snow effect that you'll only see if you're playing on the last unlockable environment. These effects were certainly not must-haves for release, but they were quick to implement, and I think they really add a nice personal touch to the gameplay experience. If you want to know how I made these effects for my game, I created a tutorial for each one that you can check out. Alright, so let's check in here. So far I've created my artwork, implemented my core gameplay, added a progression system with unlockable characters and environments, and implemented some fun visual and audio effects. At this point, the very last items on my Trello board centered around monetization. Now I want to preface this section by saying that I am in no way an expert on effectively monetizing mobile games, and that is definitely evidenced by my rather modest income so far from Blink. That said, I do have some uh, things that I think I did well and also some hindsight observations that I think are worth sharing. With Blink, I followed a pretty common monetization pattern for mobile games. I have skippable interstitial ads that play every so often and a rewarded video ad that you are rewarded for watching. I also have a 99 cent in-app purchase that removes all ads and unlocks a special playable character. I'll start by talking about my skippable interstitial ads. As it stands, this video ad will trigger based on the following criteria. 1. You've played 3 rounds or more. 2. Each of those 3 rounds you've scored 10 or more points. And 3. You press the main menu button from the in-game screen. This is what triggers the ad. Now based on those criteria, you might have noticed that if you just hit the play again button over and over again and never go back to the main menu, you'll never see an ad. And This is definitely the case, and this was an intentional choice by me. I really didn't want my very first video game to be the type of game that just bombarded you with ads all the time. That said, I think it goes without saying that this probably had a negative effect on my revenue. Next up is my rewarded video ad, which I think turned out quite nicely. On the in-game screen, you'll see an option to continue the round you've just lost by watching a video advertisement. This lets you continue your round with your previous score and multiplier, and you're given an extra multiplier to help boost your score even further. Watching this video ad gives struggling players a great shot at unlocking some of the more difficult environments, which I think is a perfect incentive. And finally comes the in-app purchase. There's really not too much to say here. As I mentioned before, it removes all ads and unlocks this little Dev Duck character. I've received a handful of these purchases, which is great and very much appreciated, but I think maybe I'd be seeing more if my interstitial ad implementation had been a bit more annoying. I honestly found it hard to strike a balance here. So that's how I monetize Blink. I'd love to hear in the comments section down below if you liked or disliked my approach here, or if you have any suggestions for me or other people who are working on games like this. One thing I did not necessarily anticipate when I set out on this journey was the effort required to publish my game on both the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. I want to provide a very, very high level list of all the resources you'll need going into the process of publishing on both of these app stores, just so, at the very least, you know what to expect and can be a little bit more prepared than I was. We'll start with iOS. You'll need an Apple developer account, which unfortunately is a rather steep barrier to entry at $100 per year. Once you have your developer account, you'll need to go into the developer portal and create an ID for your app, certificates for you and any other developers, and provisioning profiles for the development and distribution of your app. This is a really confusing process, especially if it's your first time, so I would really recommend that you head off to YouTube and watch some videos or try to find some blog posts to help you understand how to do this correctly. Once you have these development resources set up, you'll have to create an iOS build with Unity, open that up in Xcode, and archive it to App Store Connect. It's good to get familiar with App Store Connect because you'll be spending a lot of time here providing information both about yourself and your game. In terms of personal information, you'll have to provide some basic contact info, info about your bank account if you're offering anything for purchase, and you'll fill out a W-9 form so that your earnings can be reported properly to the government. Woo. When it comes to your game, you'll have to provide quite a bit of metadata like a title, subtitle, description, and tags, as well as screenshots for three specific Apple device sizes. At first I thought working on the screenshots was going to be pretty annoying, but I ended up being able to easily capture them with Unity by creating custom viewport sizes. I also decided to create a preview video for each of the three device sizes, just to spruce up my store page a little bit more. I figured this extra effort was worth it given how far I had already come. You can also expect to provide a little bit of legal information about your game. This will include first and foremost a privacy policy which you must create, host, and provide a link to. 
You also need to confirm what kind of info your app collects from players, whether all the content in your app belongs to you, and if you use any kind of encryption that needs to be disclosed. And one last important thing to check out while you're here is TestFlight, which is Apple's tool for allowing you to send out beta builds of your game to testers. I strongly suggest you use this tool after you submit your first build to get some feedback on your game and make sure features like in-app purchases are working as expected. Now, the good news is that if you tackle all this on iOS first, I think the process will go a whole lot smoother on Android. An Android developer account only requires a one-time fee of 25 bucks, which is awesome. Once you have an account, you can expect to provide the same kind of personal information and metadata for your game as you did for Apple. The good news here is that Android is much less strict than Apple on specific size requirements for your promotional images. For this reason, you can reuse the screenshots and video you've already captured for iOS, which can save you quite a bit of time, and this is why I recommend doing all this stuff on iOS first. As far as legal stuff goes, you'll have to answer similar questions about the content of your game, and you'll have to put some thought into who your targeted age group is. As I found out, Google can reject your game if you specify an age group that they think is inaccurate. And finally, the Play Console also provides its own tools for submitting beta builds to test users. These are called test tracks. To create one, you'll generate an Android build of your game with Unity, drag it into the console, and create a test track for it, which will put your app through the review process and allow you to submit a download link to your testers. Now that was a lot of info in a very short amount of time about both platforms, so here's what I think your key takeaways should be. Number one, be prepared to answer questions about yourself or your business. Number two, be prepared to provide lots of info about your game. Number three, create and host your privacy policy ahead of time so that you can provide a link. And number four, capture all your screenshots of your game ahead of time. This is a pretty long and involved process, but I can tell you from experience that once you go through it one time, it'll be easier for every game you release afterwards. After I submitted everything about my game and had my store pages ready, it was finally time to release Blink. So I did, and it was awesome. After spending years starting and giving up on projects, it was so fulfilling to finally release something. It's an experience I really hope all of you will get to enjoy. So that's it. That was nine months of learning Unity and finally releasing my first indie game, which was awesome. I hope you guys found this video helpful or at the very least motivating. I just really hope you guys get out there and are able to make great progress and eventually release your own projects. Of course, if you enjoyed this video, let me know with a thumbs and definitely stay tuned for the future. With this project wrapped up, we have another one coming on the horizon and another devlog series. So I'll see you guys in the next video.